2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 13. We camped out in verses 1 through 12 for a long, long time over the last few weeks. But now we are to verse 13. Let me just give you a little summary real quickly, just kind of since we were off last week. 2 Thessalonians, Paul addresses three main issues. Number one, suffering because of persecution. That suffering was then causing them to be shaken because they misunderstood. They thought the day of the Lord had come, the rapture had come, they've been left behind, they're going through persecution, through trials, and as a result, uh, they had missed everything. Warren Wearsby said this about the Thessalonican believers. The Thessalonians were shaken to their core. They thought the rapture had occurred and they had somehow missed it and now the day of the Lord had arrived. I want to just say this, eschatological error is still causing problems today for believers in the church. Eschatology, the study of last things, and it's not that, that it's a problem to study eschatological things, we need to. 20% of the Bible is prophecy. But we need to study it according to the whole Word of God and, and put it together in a right way. What had happened here? Because some of them said, well, we've, we've been left behind. We've, been, we've missed out. It, beca it caused them to become lazy, caused them to become apathetic, complacent in their faith and their life. Well, we just lay around. You know, we're just, we don't have any hope. And so Paul is addressing all of this. And so the third thing that I would say about as he writes 2 Thessalonians is what I call slacking because of misinterpretation. They just, they were just, had just kind of quit, quit in their faith. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. You can follow along. We're going to talk more about this when we get uh, to chapter 3. Paul, remember this, you've heard this before. If anyone will not work, Neither shall he eat. Uh, by the way, that had to do with their love feasts. That had to do with the fact that the church would get together and uh, potluck suppers are biblical. So they would all bring their food together and they were eating. But Paul's kind of putting a, the gauntlet down here. You know, if you don't work, if you're not serving the Lord, you know, you shouldn't expect to be a part of the love feast. Um, <laughs> So, for if we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. In other words, get back to work. Get back to serving the Lord. Therefore, we could summarize these three chapters of 2 Thessalonians by saying this. Encouragement to the suffering, that's chapter 1. Enlightenment to the shaken, that's chapter 2. But exhortation to the slacking in chapter 3. If you put those three things together, it'll help you to outline the whole book. Now we pick up today with chapter 2, verse 13. But I want us to get a good context by going back just a couple of verses. Look at verses 10 through 12. It's going to give us the context before we jump into the new verses. 13 and 14 describe the saved man. Just keep this in your mind. Verses 10 through 12 describe the lost man. I pray that every person, every man in this room today is saved. Amen. That you've given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Look at the attributes of the lost man from verses 10 through 12, and there are five of them. That's, it's important that you remember there are five of these. There's going to be five of the saved man. But look at the verses 10 through 12. The Antichrist will come with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Number one, they're perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. There's the second aspect of a lost man. He's not received the love of, of the truth. And for this reason, God will send strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Another part of a lost man's anatomy is that 
he just can't understand the gospel. He just, he, you know, a part of it, the part of, we talked about this, a part of the judgment of God is actually blindness on a person. If you're praying for a lost friend to be saved or a family member, pray that God will unblind them. Pray, pray that God will, will open their eyes that they can see the truth of the gospel. The fourth one found in verse 12, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth. And then here's the fifth aspect. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. Five aspects of a lost man. And how many of you know somebody like this? They live for themselves. They live for the world. They, live, they don't live for God. They, they don't think anything about the gospel. They don't think anything about church. They're just kind of living out there for themselves. And they're lost. They're lost. They, they need desperately to hear the message of the gospel and then for the Holy Spirit to empower them to believe in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Now, what about the saved man? Look at verses 13, 14. And uh, this is some pretty good deep theology we're going to jump into here in just a moment. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you. You guys, you Thessalonian, Thessalonian believers are like a breath of fresh air. Because you are beloved brethren. Saved, we are brothers in Christ. Isn't, isn't that powerful? Amen. And the word beloved there is, is like, it's the word of agapao from agape. It's a mind-blowing word. It means loved unconditionally, that God loved us. We are beloved brethren. Amen. We are brothers in Christ, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which He called you by our gospel. How many of you remember that call that God put in your life? The call of the gospel. I remember it like it was yesterday. I'd heard the gospel preached many times. Heard many preachers preach it when I was growing up. But I remember that night at uh, that Campus Crusade for Christ conference when Gene Sealander stood up there and he didn't, he didn't break any new ground. He shared the gospel, but the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It was like I heard it for the first time and God just spoke to my heart and he called you by our gospel for what purpose? The obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I, here's what I have done. I put a little chart together. I'll be glad to get this chart to you. I've just kind of put it together. The contrast between the lost and the saved. Between those who are following the Antichrist and the world of, that's against Christ and those who are following Jesus Christ. It is a clear parallel. Let me just give this to you one more time because I think it'll help you to hear the contrast together. <coughs> followers of Jesus Christ versus followers of the man of lawlessness or those who are lost. Number one, followers of Jesus Christ are loved and chosen by God from eternity. Verse 13. However, uh, those who are followers who are lost uh, are uh, doing so by their own choice and are going to perish. Verse 10, without God and without hope. Followers of Jesus Christ put their faith in the truth. The lost do not receive the love of the truth, but put their faith in falsehood. Verses 11 and 12. The followers of Jesus Christ are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. Those who are deceived by Satan, uh, wickedness seems good to them. You can see the clear contrast here between the saved and the lost. The saved are those who, call through the gospel, who are called through the gospel. The lost are those who reject the gospel which could have saved them. And then the saved are those who are destined for glorification. Man, I just can't wait for that. You know what that literally means? That means someday we're going to see Jesus. Amen. That means someday all the trials, the difficulties, the pain, the suffering, the sorrow, everything that we go through in this life, just like that, is going to be changed. 
and we will be glorified. But those who are lost are destined for condemnation. Now, I, I want to just put a nickel in the meter and stop right here. Uh, this may not mean anything to you guys, but I had to go through some courses for classes that I've been taking on Jewish Christian studies. This is a prime example in the New Testament. Uh, how many of you realize that Paul was Jewish? And all of his teaching comes from his Jewish studies, Jewish roots, trained under Gamaliel, all of that. This is a prime example, these five contrasts on each side of what's called Hebrew parallelism. Could you give me two minutes to give you these six things? Six Hebrew types of scripture. Now this is additional. This is not going to, this is really probably not going to get you closer to the Lord, but you need to know about it, all right? Um, six different kinds of Hebrew parallelism. And I want to give you a couple of examples. First of all, there's synonymous parallelism where a second line in Hebrew, in, like in the Old Testament, repeats the first uh, in different words and has the same meaning. A great example is Psalm 19.1. Listen to it. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. See how those parallel with each other? So that's synonymous. Hebrew parallelism. Then secondly, there's synthetic. The second line or following lines adds to the first of the examples. Psalm 24, 1 through 4 is a good example. The earth is the Lord's in all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. Do you see how those kind of uh, help each other and speak to each other? Then there's a third type, antithetic, where the second line or subject contrasts with the first. And that's what Paul is using here. The antithetic, 5 verses 5. Do you get this? See that? Psalm 73, 26, example. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see that? On one hand, I, I have a hard time, but on the other hand, God's my strength. Uh, the fourth one is climactic. Successive lines build to build to a climax or a summary. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18 is an example of this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit on the vines... Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. you see how it's building? Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of, of my salvation. Amen. That's climactic where it builds up to a point. Um, then there's number five, eclectic. A combination of different types of these parallelisms that are interwoven. Habakkuk 1, 2, and 4 is a great example. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity, cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention that arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgments proceeds. There's a combination in that one of several of these different Hebrew parallel types. And then the last one is emphatic, where synonymous words are used for emphasis. And a great um, example of that is the Shema out of Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, why would I take time this morning to give you those six things? Because when you get home today, your wife asks you, what did you all talk about in men's Bible study? You can say, we talked about Hebrew parallelism, the synonymous, synthetic, antithetic, climactic, eclectic, and emphatic types of Hebrew parallelism. And she will think, my husband is a genius. 
I just, I had all that in my notes and I just wanted to share it this morning, all right? It probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but it, it really, I'll tell you what it does though, when you go back and you can see how they constructed and wrote the Old Testament and how, you know, how they put, place it together and, and how they do things for emphasis, it, it really does give you a little bit of understanding. Now, let's go back to verses 13 and 14. And let's do a little deeper dive on verses 13 and 14. These two verses form like a miniature systematic theology. It's, it's amazing. In fact, some have called this the six links of the golden chain of redemption. If you want to take some notes, six links of the golden chain of redemption. Very similar to what Paul shared in Romans 8. Uh, 28 through 30. Let me read that, then we'll jump into 13 and 14. Uh, Paul says in Romans 8, 28 through 30, and we know that all things work together for good. That does not mean all things are good. It means they work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to do what? What are we predestined to do? to be conformed to the image of His Son. Listen, people ask me all the time, what do you think about predestination? I said, I'm for it because it means that, that God wants me to be like Jesus, Amen. more and more like Him. Amen. Predestination has to do with becoming conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's the purpose. Now listen to verse 30. Moreover, whom He predestinated, those He also called. And whom He called, those He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. Amen. So there's four things there. We are predestined to be like Jesus. We are called out of sin and darkness. We are justified by Calvary's cross. And we are glorified someday because of the empty tomb. Because Jesus defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave, so will we. Amen. Because He had a glorified body, resurrected body, so will we. I mean, it is, it is a powerful, powerful thing. Now, let's go back to verses 13 and 14. And I want you to see these six things that Paul gives here. These are, again, six links of a golden chain of redemption. Number one, verse 13. We are foreloved by God. Again, the word is agapao. It's, it's, I cannot even begin to express today how stunning that word is when you realize what that means. It, it, it literally is an so unconditional kind of love that it, it, when we say for God so loved the world, that may be the best English that we have to describe this word. So loved. So loved means love of all loves. And so Paul says the very first thing that you and I need to know is that we're loved by the Lord. Amen. Can I be honest with you? There are some times that I don't feel all that lovely in front of the Lord or loved by the Lord. But it's where I'm supposed to stand because it's what the Bible says. And I need to live in the sense of His love for me. So, for love by God. Here's the second part of verse 13. Elected to salvation. From the beginning, God chose you for soteria, for salvation. He chose... I don't understand all of that. Um, I would remember when I was asked 17 years ago by the pulpit committee, what do you believe about election and... And, you know, that, that all of those types of things. I said, well, here's my answer. I believe God is sovereign, and I believe He elects, but I don't know who they are, so I'm going to nominate everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, there are some things that you just, we just have to leave in the hands of the Lord. Amen. And um, we're elected to salvation. I'm, I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm for it. Amen. I'm for it because I've experienced it. And then look at the third thing, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. 
Hagiosmos is the Greek word that's used there. And it literally means we're set apart. How many of you have fine china at your home that almost never gets used? <laughs> we got, we've got a set from both grandparents. And every day I walk by the cabinet and I see it. But maybe, maybe two or three times a year we'll break the, the fine stuff out. Why do we not use that every day? It is separated for a special purpose. Does that make sense? That's what sanctification is. You and I are saved and now we are set. Now we're not set to just stay in the trophy case or in the china case. But we're, we're saved in, because we now have a new purpose. We're not paper plates anymore. You know, we're not the plastic dishware anymore. We, we have been set apart. Does that make sense? And so just kind of get that in your mind. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Look at the next one, the fourth one found in verse 13. Faith in the truth. Belief in the truth. The word for belief there is not head belief. Write this down, circle this. It means conviction. A belief is something that I hold, but a conviction is something that holds me. This is talking about convictions. You know, we, I hear people all the time say, well, you know, I, you know I, I don't know what the Word believes. We've got to know the Word, and then we've got to live by those convictions that this is the Word of God. We, we can't stray from this. We, we believe in the truth. We're convinced. You see, this is the anatomy of what happens when somebody begins that, that great journey of salvation. And then verse 14, look at the next thing. The effectual calling through the gospel to which He called you by the gospel. Guys, this is the Holy Spirit call. This is, and I pray that every, every man in this room, everyone listening to this has had that Holy Spirit call. It's not just our choice. It is our choice to receive or reject. But the Lord Jesus says that no man comes to the Father unless he's been called. And that's a process of the Holy Spirit working in your heart and calling you into salvation. Calling you into His family. Calling you into His kingdom. Oh, how I pray that you have... You've, you've seen and, and sensed the Holy Spirit call upon your life. And then the last part is the ultimate glorification of the believer. We talked about that, the obtaining of the glory by, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory for us right now is just a glimmer, but someday it's going to be a reality. Amen. We're going to stand face to face. As they say in Hebrew, panim la panim, face to face. And we will see. Do you see that whole process? Now listen, here's what I want you to get in light of the context of everything and get this today. This, these six things, this is where we are to stand by faith positionally in these last days. Don't stand on the sinking sands of this world. You stand on the absolute truth and conviction of the Word of God. When all of this chaos is spinning all around us and all the darkness and the sin, where are we to stand so that we're not blown away? Amen. Look at the very next verse. Look at verse 15. Therefore, brethren, do what? Stand fast. Stako in the Greek. I like that. Stako because it sounds like you're putting a stake down and saying this is where I'm standing. Stand fast. Present imperative. It means to keep on standing. Don't ever let there be a time where you're not standing. And hold the, the traditions. Let me stop right there and explain something. That word stand fast is literally a construction term from the Greek times where you would build a foundation and have to build footers 
that would keep the column in place. Be like a column. I am not moving from the Word of God. I am going to put my stake down right here in the midst of this battle, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm. I am going to stand fast on the Word of God. Guys, listen to me. Do not compromise. Stand fast. And then the word hold that's used there is actually from the terms of a sailor back in Paul's day. If they were on a boat and the boat was going through a terrible storm, they would grab ropes and they would hold on for dear life so they wouldn't go overboard. What a picture there of what we're to do in the midst of the storms of life. Stand fast like a pillar and hold on to the rope of Jesus. And don't let go. Hold fast the traditions. By the way, the the word traditions there, we we might get a little negative connotation there. Well, this is just something traditional that's passed down. It literally means that which is passed down from generation to generation concerning the Word of God. So it's very, very important there. Again, guys, we're talking about convictions, not beliefs. You've been saved. We know we're going to go into a spirit of lawlessness. We know we're going to go into a a climate of falling away. Paul talked about that in the first part of chapter 2. But we've been saved. We are different. We are changed. And now therefore we are going to stand like immovable posts and hold to the Lord Jesus Christ and what we've been taught, what we know from the Word of God if we don't we will drift. If we don't, we will compromise. If we don't, we will give in. And our relationship with the Lord will grow cold. And let me just say this. God just so spoke to my heart. I was pouring over these scriptures and praying about them. We must, and guys, we, maybe it would be a good thing for us in men's Bible study to make this commitment. We must pass this on to the next generation. We cannot afford to stand fast and then let them drift off. We have got to, in our churches, teach them, this is the Word of God. This is where we stand. This is right. This is wrong. We're not going to compromise. You need to be saved. We need to teach all of that. Because, listen, there, there are churches today that have they've not held on to the traditions and the teachings of the past. And now they're drifting. We can't afford to do that. Warren Wiersbe said this, Hold God's Word with a firm grasp and never let it slip away. Like a relay race, each generation must take the baton and make sure it's held firmly as to be passed to the next generation. Paul said this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Does that make sense? We pass it along. We pass it along. Man, these are powerful verses in light of the day that we're living in. And and I think Paul is saying here, this is not the time to wear a white robe and sit on a fence and and passively wait for the Lord's return. Well, I'm just going to kind of hunker down and bear it. No, this is a time. David Jeremiah said this, this is a time to use the powers, the gifts, the strength, the influence, and the energy you have to get busy for God. Man, I love that. Most important and clear objective of Christians is not only to go to heaven, but to take as many people with us as we can. We've got to share the gospel. We've got to teach our children. We've got to build up one another. We've got to strengthen one another. We've got to encourage those who are fallen. We've got to reach out to those who are hurting. Jesus said, in every good work, occupy till I come. This is the time to mash on the gas and not slink back in the shadows and say, well, the world has overcome us. No, we we got we to gotta act like a big Abrams tank and go through the building Amen. 
and go over the building and not let anything stop us. How many of you have heard of General Robert Neyland's seven maxims that they use down with the football team? There are seven of them, and they still quote them today. You know, before they go out for a ball game, they'll still quote the seven things that the stadium, the General Neyland, by the way, he was a really good friend of my grandfather. My grandfather had a house that was right behind the practice fields, and General Neyland and the, the, uh, the armory was across the street on the other side. This is where all the fraternities were built. General Neyland would park under a big, huge shade tree under my grandfather's house and could either go to the armory or go to the practice field. And they became really, really good buddies. But Max, uh, Neyland had seven maxims. And I think about this from time to time as a pastor. Some of them relate more to football, but, but two of them really relate to me as far as how I want to lead our church and what I want to do. Number three and number seven. Here's General Neyland's number three and number seven maxim. Number three, if at first the game or the breaks go against you, don't let up, put on more steam. Amen. I love that. And then number seven, carry the fight to the opponent and keep it there for 60 minutes. I like that because my enemy is the devil and I don't want him to ever get a foothold. Amen. Well, this is the day that God wants us to stand Amen. in light of all that's happening. Verse 16, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God and Father, notice how Paul puts the Lord Jesus and God the Father on the same plane, who has, now here it is again, who has loved us. Agapao. Uh, man, it's so good to be reminded that God loves us. No matter what comes, guys, listen, some of you may have walked in this room today. I want to just say this. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Amen. More than conquerors. And has given us everlasting consolation and a good hope by grace. Eternal comfort. Comfort that never ends. Comfort that is not conditioned on circumstances. By the way, Spurgeon said this. You've got to have a Spurgeon quote today. There's music in those two sets of words like David's harp. It charms away the evil spirit of melancholy. Here are the two sets. Number one, everlasting comfort. He said, consolation is that sense that our sins are forgiven, our transgressions are pardoned, we've been accepted by God, we're no longer enemies but friends, and we're standing in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So even if sickness comes, if death comes, if loss comes, if ruin comes, if persecution comes, we know and we possess an everlasting comfort that cannot leave us. But here's the second one, the second phrase. Good hope. Good hope by His grace. Now the world's hope is a hope so. I hope so. I hope it'll all work out. That's not our hope. In fact, the Greek word that is used here for hope means confident expectation. Amen. Not that, well, I hope so. It's I hope because I know. Amen. I know. Amen. By the way, I, I just put this together. We're almost done today. i I. Everything, when you're a pastor, you start trying to sermonize everything. So I put together five marks of, of good hope. Let me give these to you as we close today. Five marks of a good hope. Number one, it is a hope that begins at salvation. Number two, it's a hope that is drawn from Scripture. That's where we stand. That's where our hope's at. My hope is in the Word of God. My hope is what God said, not what the world says. Number three, it's a hope that's founded on Christ, on Him. Number four, it's a hope that's felt within my heart. And number five, it is a hope that can be declared to others. We can pass on that hope to others who do not have it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name, for on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground. Let me say it again. All other ground is sinking sand. 
Paul ends by saying, comfort your hearts and establish me. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. May all that we do and say in the midst of these dark days bring honor to the Lord, reveal that we're saved, we're not going anywhere, we're going to stand fast, we're going to be men of God, and we're going to continue to, to go on forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I pray that you would take this encouraging word today and, and help us and to apply it to our own lives. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what the falling away looks like in these last days, and no matter what lawlessness occurs in our world, no matter what the devil's crowd comes up with or wants to do next, that we know where we stand. And that we're going to stand like pillars and we're going to hold to the rope and we're going to, to cleave to the Word of God and cleave to our love for You and Your love for us. So Lord, thank You for loving us. We don't understand it, but we sure do love it and enjoy it and appreciate it and are grateful for it. Lord, lead us and guide us. Help us to be strong leaders in our homes, in our families, in our churches. We give You the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.